Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and as always, I have my friend here, Adam, co-hosting the show with me. How are you doing on this Friday, Adam? I'm ready to go passwordless. Let's do it. We have a great topic for you guys this week. One of the things that we have always talked about on our show is the balance between security and usability for different situations for users. A lot of times when we make something more secure, it oftentimes makes it more difficult for a user to access the information, access the system, do their daily job. But with passwordless authentication, which is our topic this week, it's one of those few times when you actually make something more secure and also easier for the user to use the product. So on a few episodes past, we've talked about password protection and making better passwords. When you make more complicated passwords, oftentimes it's harder for the users to remember them. It's harder for them to enter the passwords in. And so one of the things that is a great method to ease that is passwordless authentication. And I mentioned that passwordless authentication is actually more secure. And that's because when you type in a password into your machine or for any account, generally that password will traverse the internet or traverse the wire. With passwordless solutions, they usually store the secret key in some sort of secure hardware token on that device, whether it be for Windows machine, like a TPM chip, or for cell phones, like some sort of secure enclave, like for an iPhone. And that is unique to that device. And because it's unique to the device, it is essentially a multi-factor type of authentication because you have to have the device as well as that method of authentication, be it a PIN or some sort of biometric authentication. The thing to know about all of these passwordless methods is that for the most part under the covers, they function the same. It's just the implementation details that are different. So it's like Andy mentioned, is it a secure enclave on Apple Silicon versus is it a TPM on a Windows PC? And how do you unlock that secret key and all of those kind of different factors? Those are just implementation details. But at its core, one really, really important thing to know is that passwordless technology is not really some sort of moon technology technology that's really new and really obscure. In fact, it's based on something really fundamental to something we use all the time, and that's public private key cryptography. This idea that I can mathematically create two quote unquote keys. One is a public key that anybody can know, and one is a private key that only I hold. And anything that I sign cryptographically with my private key can be matched to my public key to validate that that only could have come from me. And under the covers, all of these methods work exactly the same way. There's a private key that's stored in some sort of secure enclave. It is unlocked through the use of a pin or a biometric, and it signs a proof. And that proof is what's transmitted across the network, as opposed to, like Andy mentioned, a specific actual password or hash or something like that. So it's just a proof. And the proof is time-bound as well. So if I try to replay it later, it's not going to pass the time check. So really kind of a one-time use thing that can only be used once. And it's going to validate that, yep, Andy obviously must have had had his device and he must have successfully unlocked it because that was signed with Andy's private key. And I know Andy's private key is securely held by Andy on only that device and it matches the public key I hold. So just keep that in mind as we talk through this. This is not some crazy esoteric kind of thing. It's based on really fundamental public private key cryptography and under the covers, whether the implementation details are different, it's really technology we've been using for a very long time. And for consumer electronics, this has been around for a while. If you can imagine your cell phone for a minute, whether it be an Android device or an iPhone device, both of those types of devices are tied to some sort of identity or online account. For Android phones, it's your Google account. For Apple phones, it's your iCloud account. Now, just imagine for a second, because this is what you do in an enterprise when you type in your username and password to authenticate to your computer. It'd be the same as if you were taking your iCloud or Google account and having to enter in the password every time you unlock that device. 
Now that's crazy because your password is generally somewhat complicated and it's tied to your identity. So if you ever had to give that password to someone that opens up services and access to all of your accounts data. So a while ago, Google and Apple implemented some sort of alternate sign in, whether it be a pin and then slowly they put in fingerprint and facial ID. But those are just secure methods of authenticating to your account, to your phone using their tied to your online identity. And those methods, the pin, the the facial ID, the fingerprint, again, they are unique to that device. Just like when you get a new phone, you have to reset up your facial ID, your fingerprint, and your pin. If you had two phones side by side, you could set them to the same pin. You could set them to different pins. And if I had your pin, I would also have to have your phone in order to unlock it because you could set that pin to something else versus if your password is compromised, then I would have access to your online account anywhere. And so that's why when we talk about this, just think about it for a minute. Passwordless authentication is actually more secure because you're not having to transmit that password over the wire. The method of authentication stays with that specific device. When you switch over to kind of the PC side of the house, looking at both the Macintosh and and Windows PCs, they have some passwordless methods as well. So Windows Hello refers to a suite of passwordless sign-in options on Windows PCs where you can do picture sign-in where you click on specific parts of a picture. You can do a pin. You can also do facial recognition or fingerprint as well. One thing to keep in mind is that under the covers, how Windows Hello works for consumer Windows PCs and how Windows Hello for business business works for enterprise scenarios are totally different. So very similar name, of course, because they borrow the first two words. However, just know under the covers, the implementation details are very different. And with Macintoshes as well, they have uh, passwordless methods. Many MacBooks today ship with a fingerprint reader. So touch ID right on the keyboard in the upper right corner where you can just tap your fingerprint. Apple's also doing something interesting in other Macintoshes that might not have that biometric option where you can use your Apple Watch to do some sort of authentication to your Mac. Now I have this set up on on my Mac and it is kind of an interesting idea because you can use your Apple Watch to unlock your Mac. You can use your Apple Watch to open security panes or basically replace putting in your administrator password. And that's really interesting because at the time you're authenticating with your Apple Watch, it doesn't really ask you to do anything other than double click the button on your Apple Watch. And so you might think, well, that's only really kind of single factor authentication because it's just a proof of possession, although there's also proximity checking that goes on there. But keep in mind, when you first put that Apple Watch on your wrist, you have to do something to unlock it. So there's also a factor in there that that Apple Watch has been continuously worn and has never been removed from your wrist. And you had to do some other method like a knowledge factor, or you unlocked your iPhone. And now you're really kind of getting into a chain of trust here to unlock it initially. And then there's also some passwordless methods uh, with Microsoft accounts. Andy, do you want to talk about those? Yeah, Microsoft, when they were rolling out passwordless authentication, they actually rolled it out to their consumer accounts first. So your at Outlook.com or Hotmail.com or whatever is tied to your Microsoft account that you sign into Xbox, Office 365 on the consumer side. And it works very similar to how it is for enterprise accounts. But essentially, you can turn it on, you can go to your security settings and turn on passwordless authentication. And one of the great things is if you have this on, you can set your consumer password to something extremely complex. And if you buy a new Windows computer from the out-of-box experience, when you're starting to set up that PC and you sign into your Microsoft account, you never have to put in your password. All you have to do is sign in using your email and then it'll send a notification to your phone with the Authenticator app. It'll have you match the number that is being displayed, authenticate to the app, and then it authenticates you to your your Microsoft account. This also works the same way if you're signing in and checking your email with Hotmail or Outlook. And they also have implemented FIDO2 keys where you can sync a USB key to your Microsoft account and plug that in and authenticate to it on any computer as well without having to put in your password. So they rolled this out all for consumer accounts before they rolled it out to enterprise accounts and it's extremely well done. 
there's really been a convergence of the capability set of the Microsoft accounts, the consumer accounts, or what are referred to as MSAs, with Azure AD accounts. They're coming closer and closer together over time. You'll even notice that the login screens are almost identical anymore. And uh, currently, the feature set is the same as well. One thing that's coming to Microsoft accounts next year, Andy, you just mentioned this. You mentioned setting your password to something really complex, and then you never have to use it. Starting next year, it will be possible to have a Microsoft account that doesn't have a password, where you can only authenticate to it with passwordless methods. So that's really, really interesting because if you think of the journey of going passwordless, I always point out to people when they say, whoa, 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 we're not ready for this, you know, slow your roll. We're not ready to get rid of passwords. And I say, you know, the first step is having a credible alternative to passwords. And that's where we are right now. We need to get you to stand up these credible alternatives and get them deployed broadly in your organization before we can even think about starting to get rid of passwords. And if you think of the multiple steps along the journey, step one, one is credible alternatives. Step two is I rarely use my password. Step three is I really don't know my password because I never use it. And step four, that final step is I literally don't have a password in the directory at all. My user identity does not have a password associated with it. So we have a long journey to go from step one to step four. And almost everybody's at step one. Although that is interesting now that Microsoft accounts are going to be one of those first accounts where you can literally go stage four. There is no password. And that's going to be available starting early next year. So keep your eyes peeled for that. When it comes to an enterprise, a lot of organizations use Windows. So this next part would be for those organizations who are using Windows. And if you have not enabled passwordless authentication or Windows Hello for Business, this is something that I would highly recommend. Now, when it comes to Windows Hello for Business, that is when you are authenticating to your Windows computer using a pin, or if you have an IR camera built in, you can authenticate using your facial recognition software or a fingerprint reader. It also works with external cameras that are Windows Hello for Business certified or fingerprint readers that are external as well. There's a couple of different ways of implementation and through trial and error and some forum surfing, I've gotten it to work. So I'm going to give you the cliff notes on it because depending on where your organization is at, it's a little bit different depending on if you are solely on-prem or if you're in some sort of hybrid configuration or cloud only. So if you are on-prem only, and that means you are domain joined computer computers, you run Exchange Server on-prem, SharePoint on-prem, everything on-prem, and you don't have any cloud presence, and there are still a few organizations out there like that, you can use Windows Hello for Business servers that are on-prem. There's complete documentation on standing up Windows Hello for Business servers on-prem, as well as you can use the group policy. There's a Windows Hello for Business group policy that you can turn on. If you are somewhat hybrid, and that means anywhere from registering your devices in Azure or O3 365 if you are an O365 customer. If you touch the cloud at all, the group policy to enforce Windows Hello for Business will not work. So to save you the trouble, because if you turn it on and you're an O365 customer, you're going to find that it does nothing. There is, however, a GPO for turning on the pin to sign into your computer. And that does enable a user to go to the settings and turn on Windows Hello for Business. And it does do the sync with Azure AD on the back end but it doesn't enforce them, which is kind of the key point where you're prompting the user to sign in and use Windows Hello for Business. This depends more on turning on the group policy and then putting on some sort of communication to the users and saying, hey, we've turned on this feature, please go in and enable it. If you are using hybrid Azure AD join devices, you can offload the configuration workload from System Center Configuration Manager to Intune. And as long as you have a configuration profile within Intune, configured to turn on Windows Hello for Business, that will enforce the policy as well. So we've talked about hybrid Azure AD joining devices previously. This is probably where a lot of organizations will go to next. It's pretty simple to do. You have to sync your device OUs using your Azure AD sync server to Azure AD and turn on the hybrid Azure AD join. And then you still have to do some configuration on your SCCM server to enable co-management. But if you get all that work done, you can then enforce Windows Hello for Business with hybrid Azure AD joined devices. And then, of course, the easiest way to do it is to do Azure AD joined machines. Then this is just the pure cloud management solution. And then you would use Intune to manage the devices and have the Windows Hello for Business configuration done and pushed out through Intune. 
definitely go take a look at the formal documentation for this because there's about four or five different deployment methodologies depending on which scenario you're in. And the documentation actually does a pretty good job of helping you understand which is going to be the right one for you and which set of directions you need to follow. And then there's going to be step-by-step guidance on everything you need to click and do to get this stood up. So kind of adding on to what Andy said, most of you are going to be in the hybrid mode and you're going to be picking between key trust and certificate trust. And and that's a deep rabbit hole. I don't think we want to go in on this pod. It's it's definitely if you have questions about it, you know, let us know. But overall, there's pretty good guidance there in the documentation on which one to do. The less common ones are going to be the fully on-prem. I don't have a lot of customers that way anymore. And then uh, the fully cloud. There hopefully are going to be more and more scenarios where you have those pure Azure AD joined devices because they're awesome. And you should really move away from domain joined devices because LOL, having a dependency on a corporate network today has kind of been bananas. But yeah, there, there's there's really good documentation on it. So definitely take a look at that and it, it will walk you through it. I do want to make one other point just super crystal clear because this is something I, I hammer home all of the time. If you were listening to Andy talk about Windows Hello for Business and you tuned him out because you thought, well, the Dells or HPs we have don't have those cameras or fingerprint readers, so we can't use it. Stop, hit rewind, go back and listen to the section again because you do not need biometric support to enable Windows Hello for Business. I'll repeat that. You do not need biometric support to do Windows Hello for Business. In fact, I have a Surface Book 3. It's my corporate issue device from Microsoft. It sits docked with the lid closed 99% of the time. So how do I sign in with Windows Hello for Business almost all the time? I use my PIN. Six digits, numeric, never expires, really easy, and much more secure than passwords. So please, 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 if you take anything away from this, don't tune out this whole Windows Hello conversation because you think you have to have biometric metric. You do not. And PIN can still be a dramatically better user experience because it can be simpler and less complex than your password policy. And it can be more secure because you're not transmitting a shared secret over the network. So just take away, if nothing else, take away that, please. Yeah, I'll just echo that again. Just think about your consumer electronics, right? Everyone nowadays, you're wearing a mask, hopefully, and your facial recognition is failing. And when that fails, it usually defaults to what on your on your phones, your pin, right? And so even that is more secure than having to, again, think back to the analogy of having to enter in your iCloud password every time you go into your phone or your Google account password every time you go into your phone. That is essentially what you're doing when you enter in your password. So pin is more secure than your password. Obviously, having some sort of biometrics is a little bit more convenient, but the security of it is essentially the same. And please do not make your PIN policy as complex as your password policy. It is tied to that device. It's local to that device. TPM is anti-hammering built into it at a silicon level. So there is no need to make that as complex or make it expire like a password. Go easy on your PIN policy. Again, I'll say it right out in the open. Microsoft's policy, six-digit numeric never expires. That's our PIN policy, and we are one of the most attacked organizations in the world. So take that to the bank. You do not need super complex PIN compliance complexity because it is not a password. It is local to the device, it is unique to the device, and it is never transmitted over the wire. Yeah, that's what I made our pin policy too. Six digit minimum never expires. You can always choose to make it something more complex as a user, but from a policy standpoint is what we're saying, you don't enforce something more complex. Mm -hmm. Just make it simple enough for the masses, right? Adam, you and I were having a conversation quick before the podcast about the Authenticator app, and that's how you enable passwordless authentication to your accounts within an enterprise. Now, I was mentioning that I have a few different enterprise accounts, and one of them I haven't enabled. There's actually a selection within Azure AD that you check off to enable passwordless authentication, and the behavior of that is a little bit different than multi-factor, right? We've talked about multi-factor authentication where you're getting you're putting in your password and and then you get a prompt for that second factor. Whereas passwordless, it's a specific option where you actually skip the password part. And then with the Microsoft Authenticator app, you get a number that shows up and then the 
the screen will show a number and you have to match that number, which is more of like a, a check of that you're human, I guess. And then it usually will ask for another authentication to the app itself, where if you have some sort of biometrics enabled, it'll say, put your thumb over the, the touch ID or use your, your facial ID. And if it doesn't detect that, it'll default to the pin of the phone before it actually sends that push back. So it essentially makes sure that one, you're human, and then two, you really are who you say you are before it sends that authentication token back. Yep. So keep in mind, you know, as, as I mentioned at the very top of the show, how just the implementation details are different. So in the case of Authenticator app, and I'm just going to use iOS as, a, as an example, because I can speak to it more fluidly. Microsoft is using Apple's data protection API to store that private key securely in the sandbox for the Authenticator app. The data protection API protects it, you know, with on-device hardware keys and encryption and all that good stuff. When the Authenticator app wants to open up that key and use it, first it has to perform authentication authentication against the device. And that's where Andy talked about the biometric or the pin. And then that key is unlocked. It uses that private key to sign a proof. It transmits the proof over the network. So again, different implementation, but same concept. And that is something you can turn on just for a subset of your users in your organization. You can turn it on for all of them. So you can pick uh, how many people you want to target with it. And if you want to test this out, it's super easy to just target like an IT group or a pilot group. But if you don't even want to do that, or you don't want to mess with change control, the implementation is literally exactly the same as it is for a Microsoft consumer account. So go stand up an MSA, go try to sign into Outlook.com, get that passwordless experience with the app. It's identical to how it would look for your enterprise and your Azure AD account. So super nice, again, for like standing up a new Windows device, say with Autopilot or Azure AD Join, uh, you just type in your username and then match the numbers and, and do your biometric on your, your mobile device and away you go. So it's it's really slick. It's very nice. And the third method of passwordless is going to be FIDO2 security keys. Now, this is an open standard that defines how hardware tokens, a, a physical USB device that you plug into your USB port, or it can be NFC as well, can store that, that private key, you do something to unlock it, and then that gets transmitted. And there's a whole bunch of form factors and a whole bunch of vendors here. Everybody knows Yubico, the YubiKey. Absolutely, YubiKeys support FIDO2, some of the more recent models. They also have a cheaper Yubico security key that supports it as well. And there's other options that support things like biometric, like I have a, a FIDO2 key that has a fingerprint reader. Where I think this is going to get really interesting is there are partnerships with companies that make proximity key cards, like you use in your badge to open the door at your office, like HID is one of those vendors. And the idea is to put a portion of that badge with an NFC portion that is FIDO2 compliant. So now you can imagine you tap your badge to an NFC reader, or if you have a device that has NFC built in even better, and that's going to be one of your factors that's going to be proof of possession, then you'll have to put in a pin on device as your second factor, and then you would be able to authenticate. So FIDO2 is supported both for web authentication. So you're in a web browser, you're trying to go to an Azure AD backed resource like outlook.office.com or SharePoint online, and you'll get a prompt to plug in your key and do your thing. And that's supported on practically any modern browser at this point on Mac OS, iOS, Android, Windows 10. And Linux, um, if your browser supports it and your OS supports it, you're going to be good to go. So truly cross-platform. One other scenario where that can be used is with Windows 10 PCs to sign in from like the sign-in screen. So you have a Windows 10 PC, you want to sign in and, and go do something. You plug in your FIDO2 key, you tap the circle, or you do the fingerprint reader or whatever, and you'll be signed in and, and off and running. Now, initially, that was only supported for Azure AD Join devices. So those are devices, again, that pure cloud managed model. This is now also supported more recently with hybrid Azure AD join devices as well. So that's kind of newer tech, but it is there. And really, as far as when should you use what technology, because we kind of threw multiple ones out here, Windows Hello for Business is, is going to be your default for any time you have a one-to-one -one relationship. So this is Andy's laptop, and Andy only uses that device. Use Windows Hello for Business. If you have a device where multiple people are going to walk up to it and use it over the course of a day, like a PC that sits on a manufacturing floor or clinical scenarios in healthcare, that's going to make a lot more sense 
sense to use FIDO2. FIDO2 is really designed for those multi-user single device kind of scenarios. So there's different options for, for depending on what use case you need, but kind of keep that in mind. You don't want to try to use Windows Hello for multiple users on a single device because it doesn't scale. It's not really designed to do that. And then one other method, just as long as we're on the subject and I don't have to come back to it later, and this is really only supported for web-based authentication models. Azure AD does now support a opportunity to sign in essentially with just phone number and SMS. And this is really thought of for first-line worker scenarios. So retail, manufacturing are going to be big ones here. Uh, hospitality maybe as well, where somebody steps up to a, a web interface and they need to sign into say an HR app. And they can type in their phone number and they'll be registered as somebody in your enterprise. And they'll get a text message with a one-time passcode and they'll plug that in. And then they'll be able to sign in and get to their thing. So that's great again for those first-line worker scenarios where they don't need to sign in frequently and they may not remember a password anyway. But keep in mind, compared to every other passwordless method we've talked about to this point, all of which are, are multi-factor options, that is really only a single factor option. That is pretty much just proof of possession. Do you have your device, your, your smartphone, or it could be a feature phone? And can you receive a text message? So don't use that for super secure scenarios. But for a lot of first line worker scenarios, people are doing really very insecure things already, like having a default password that's something like, you know, your birthday plus your last name or something weird like that because people forget them all the time. So this is still probably a big step up from those, but do not consider that a, a super secure option. But for certain use cases, it's going to make a lot of sense. And up until now, we've only talked about Microsoft and and maybe you're thinking, well, we don't use Microsoft, we use some other identity provider. I'll speak to Okta because I know Okta's technology. Microsoft came out with the passwordless features, I think sometime in 2018. And in 2019, Okta was still rolling out in their beta features, factor sequencing. You know, a lot of identity providers probably looked to Microsoft and saw the writing on the wall and started to develop their own passwordless type technology. And so this factor sequencing through Okta is essentially a passwordless method of signing in, but it works kind of similar to what Adam was mentioning with the SMS sign-in. So when you enable it, by default, you skip your password entry when it's enabled for a user and just go straight to the prompt for your multi-factor through the app. And you approve the app just like you would a push notification without any type of authentication behind it. So as long as you have your phone open and authenticated to the phone and it's unlocked, the authenticator app will get a push notification and you can just approve it. Just like Adam said, this is more just a proof of having the device versus multi-factor authentication because you only have the one factor. Now there is a way to turn on a requirement to have Face ID or a PIN, just like with Microsoft. With Microsoft, it's it's default to force you to re-authenticate to that app prior to sending that authentication token back. With Okta, it's an option. So it is less user-friendly because if I don't have it turned on, I'm able to receive my push notifications on like a smartwatch and just approve it right there. But if I do require Face ID prior to sending that push back, then I do have to go back into my phone. I have to re authenticate to the app, make sure that I am me before that push gets sent over. So just know that there are third party IDPs that are starting to integrate this technology. It's definitely something worth investigating. If you don't use Microsoft's authentication or Okta, you use something else, I would inquire and see if there's something that coming down the pipeline or if it's already implemented, because it does make the user experience overall much better than having to enter in your username, your password, and then multi-factor, whereas you just get the multi-factor prompt. And it's, it's great you talked about that because there are going to be different scenarios where these different methods make sense. And so we should definitely not be dismissive of something and say, well, if it's not multi-factor, it's not worth anything. Because again, there are going to be some times when we're willing to give up some level of security for convenience or, or for just practicality, for being pragmatic, where I'm a first-line worker, I have access to nothing, I don't even have an email account. The only thing I do once a year is benefits enrollment with my organization. 
conversation. Other than that, I never touch a, a PC for my company. Well, then that's a perfectly acceptable option for that, right? It, it depends on the level of access somebody has, how much we need to secure it. So keep that in mind. And, and that's super valuable. Microsoft's approach generally has been that passwordless is going to be the stronger method because it is two-factor at its core. And one thing to know about that as well is if you set an Azure AD conditional access policy that says uh, you must do MFA in this scenario, and if a user is signed in with any of the passwordless methods we talk about, Windows Hello, Passwordless, and the Authenticator app, a FIDO2 key, they're never going to even see that MFA prompt. They're just going to slide right in. And that's great. That's great for user experience. But just keep that in mind in case you are surprised by that outcome that is indeed by design. Uh, So that's worth pointing out. I've gotten the question before, Adam. As an employee, I'm concerned with my organization storing some sort of biometrics on me on company property, on company device, my face, my fingerprint. What would you say to a customer if they're concerned about Windows Hello for Business storing their personal information, identity information on their employer's device? I take this sort of thing very seriously. So Andy and I... I think one of the things that developed our friendship initially was that we are both very privacy centric, very privacy focused. And it is a point of pride for me to work at a company like Microsoft, where our CEO says so openly, privacy is a fundamental human right. And we truly believe that at Microsoft, at my employer, I'm really, really, really proud of that. And there's a reason why I use almost exclusively Microsoft and Apple products as much as possible. And it's because I think both companies as as kind of the elder statesmen of the industry have a really fanatical focus on preserving privacy as much as possible. It's really important to us. And it's it's genuinely not just a differentiator, I think, at both companies. I think it's core to their mission of protecting privacy in a, in a world where there is so much uh, pervasive surveillance of you in the information sphere. So I just want to start off by saying that, and I know Andy is totally aligned with me on that. Microsoft has even started to do some things, and Apple has been good about this as well, of limiting what your employer can collect about you or what they can control about you. So Apple has moved in iOS world, for example, to limit what your employer can do on your iPhone because employers are being gross, if I'm being candid. And now in current versions of iOS and moving forward, there's this new method of enrollment called user enrollment that literally prevents what what your employer can do. And Microsoft has done things in the past, like in Microsoft Intune, where if a device was personally enrolled, we prevented your employer from being able to catalog what apps are installed on your device for your privacy, but also to protect the employer because honestly, they don't want to know. And it can reveal a lot what kind of apps you use on a phone. So I'm getting off topic, but I just want to kind of point out here that it is something that that Microsoft has a history of emphasizing as we kind of talk through this with all these different scenarios. So one thing to know about how biometrics work is there is nothing being stored that is a reproducible representation of your face or your fingerprint. What is being stored is essentially math, math of all the details of how far apart different aspects are and uh, different characteristics about the different measurements taken of your fingerprint or your face. And that is stored in a secure piece of silicon, either a TPM or in the secure enclave of an Apple silicon processor or whatever. And there are really strict hardware controls in place as to what even can be read from an operating system level anyways. So it's already not a representation but it's really hard for the system that's running on the device, even if it were to be compromised by a bad guy or your organization, to be able to go read those biometric factors. So they could never reproduce your face. They can't reproduce your fingerprint anyways. And they honestly can't even get to it because there's physical hardware isolation between those different processors. So know all of that kind of upfront. And I'm not going in great detail, but the important thing to understand is that there is a lot of engineering effort to ensure that it's just not possible. There's nothing there that could be interesting. And even if you could get to it, which you can't, it would be impossible to extract that data back out. So when you like scan your face or you scan your fingerprint, what happens is it takes all those measurements again, it compares them to what is stored. And there's a factor there that says, is this close enough to most likely be the same person? And it's measured within, you know, one in a hundred thousand or one in one million, or, or I forget what the current numbers are, but that's basically how it works. It's just doing a mathematical comparison and saying, is this close enough? So no, your organization does not have your face and does not have your fingerprint. And even if they wanted to get it, there is 
design at a hardware computer engineering silicon level that would prevent them from getting it. And it's only stored local on your device. So I don't think there's, there shouldn't be once you take time to understand this, any real concerns about what your employer can or can't do with that. They can't do anything with it. They don't have access to it at all. And even if they could, it's not interesting because it's not really your face. It's not really your fingerprint. It's a bunch of math that is plausibly your face or plausibly your fingerprint when it's taken through that same sensor. And then there's even interesting things that Apple does, for example, where every single unique like face ID sensor or, or touch ID sensor introduces some, some unique characteristics on a per device basis. So even if you could like take those chips and go put them in another iPhone, the face ID sensor, the touch ID sensor, it won't make sense to it because they're they're mathematically different. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot that goes on there. And and, and I am deeply concerned about privacy, and I have no problem using my bio- biometrics on all the things. There's much, much bigger things to be concerned about than that. I love the way that you explain that, and certainly that makes me feel better. Um, and it should make anyone who's listening to this podcast feel better about enabling a biometrics uh, for their company devices. The whole goal, if you've been listening to our podcast from the beginning, or if you're just coming in now, our goal is to secure identities, right? So straight from the get-go, we talked about making better passwords, making more complicated passwords, implementing things like password protection so that you don't have a easily guessed password. And then we talk about kind of when you should change them. We talked about conditional access and risk-based user risk and and uh, sign in risk. And if, if your password becomes compromised, then we can send a password reset. And that would be the only time that you would reset your password, I- ideally um, in the long run. And Adam talked about how Microsoft has already gone to never resetting their passwords. And that's where I think hopefully in the future we're going to get to. You set a really long, complicated password. You never reset it until it becomes compromised. And then you provide now users a way to authenticate securely without ever having to enter in that password. And then as Adam mentioned, not far in the in the future, there's going to be accounts where you don't even have a password anymore. So this is kind of the, the roadmap to get there. If you haven't enabled Windows Hello for Business, I would highly recommend it. If you have an IDP that has password lists or if you're using Azure AD to authenticate, enable password lists. You can test it with single users, security groups. You can enable it for the entire organization. But definitely take a look at it. We'll put a ton of documentation in the notes for this episode to make sure that you guys can follow along. If you have any questions on implementing or how to do this stuff, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Let me come over the top of what you said, Andy. So if you've ever sat in a a Microsoft meeting with the sales team or with our technical folks, like at our Microsoft Technology Centers, a a favorite Microsoft phrase is go do's. And so I have go do's for everyone on this podcast today. Go turn on all of the passwordless methods for at least a pilot group in IT and get yourself some FIDO2 keys, get your boss to allow you to expense a couple. They're super cheap. So this is a no brainer and start testing. And And I encourage you to get a plan in place within the next 12 months to have all of your Windows PCs have Windows Hello for Business enabled and to have enabled all of the passwordless options, FIDO2, an authenticator app, if you're a Microsoft shop, for all of your users. Within a year, have everyone have access to passwordless methods. That doesn't mean you're enforcing them. That doesn't mean that's the exclusive option, but make them available. Because once you've taken that step, then we get to the next steps, which are people rarely use their passwords passwords. People don't know their passwords and then people don't have passwords. But we have to take this step first and it's never going to get any easier. We're not going to figure out all the goofy edge cases and challenging scenarios until you broadly deploy it. So get it deployed, give your IDP feedback on what doesn't work or the scenarios they need to figure out so we can all move forward and kick passwords to the curb. But it starts today. So go turn on password list and start testing it in IT and make plans to broadly deploy it. That's our episode this week. We hope you enjoyed listening. We hope you learned something. Our contact information is going to be in the show notes, our Twitter handle, our LinkedIn profiles. If there's a security topic you want us to talk about or ask our opinion on, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.